For this video, we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks. Now, we've already seen some recurrent neural networks in the form of Hopfield networks. So a recurrent neural network is one where the neurons are um, projecting to each other and you have lots of circuits. It's no longer a directed acyclic graph. Um, so the goal for today is to see the uses, uh, some uses of recurrent neural networks. What are they used for? What are they good for? And uh, one popular way of training them. So thus far, we've mainly focused on feed-forward neural networks. So you've got an input, and it goes through a sequence of layers, and then there's an output. There are no loops in a feed-forward network, but there are reasons that we might want to have uh, feedback connections uh, that create loops. So for example, um, we recently looked at recurrent continuous time networks to implement dynamics um, in the form of Hopfield networks, but you can you can have uh, recurrent neural networks that don't just um, go to some equilibrium uh, state. You can actually set up neural networks that will go through some sort of, um, execute some dynamics that go through some orbit, um, like an oscillator, or you can even implement uh, interesting dynamical systems like Lorenz attractor, but we're not going to talk about those. Another example though, uh, if we want to build a running memory into our neural network, and so that the, neuro, the network can use previous information to make decisions in the future. So consider, to, to get a better idea of what I'm talking about, consider the task of predicting the next word in these sentences. Emma's cat was sick, so she took her to the morgue? No, vet is the idea I had in mind. I'll work it out with pencil and paper. Hopefully, that's the word that came to your mind. She picked up this object, studied it, then put it down. Of course, there are other solutions. She could have put it in her pocket. That's also a valid answer. But you can't just put anything there. She picked up the object, studied it, then put it photosynthesis. That doesn't make any sense. Somehow, the words that you're choosing depend on the sentence that you've seen so far. Okay, sequences of numbers, 0, 2, 4, 6, uh, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. I could put any number there, but the numbers that I put there fit this pattern. In each case, the word you predict depends in very complex ways on the words that preceded it. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, if I only gave you the, the word immediately before, so, for example, I just gave you the, <clears throat> and said, what's the next word? You'd be like, I don't know, the year, the catastrophe, the pencil, whatever. It could be anything. But Emma's cat was sick, so she took her to the. Now you have a lot more information. Somehow you've built up this mental state that has a lot of context in it. That's the idea <clears throat> for neural networks, for recurrent neural networks. So, Thus, a network will probably have to encode an ordered sequence of words to solve this problem. And so recurrent neural networks often deal with sequences of inputs. So how do we, how do we deal with a sequence of inputs? So solution one, we could design the network so that the entire sequence is input all at once. So for example, we could have, uh, in the, the numerical example, let's say we had input uh, 0, 2, 4, six, each of those is input into these different input nodes. And then what we want out is an eight. So that would work. And, and there are times when this is the perfectly legitimate thing to do. There are issues with it though. So one issue is that the network can only consider fixed length sequences. <clears throat> and the other issue is that no processing can occur until the entire sequence is given. So you just sort of, the network sort of, it can't do anything. It, it, its input isn't even complete until we see the zero to four and finally the six, and finally we can do something. My cat's over here. <laughs> okay. So. We're not going to use that solution where you input the entire sequence. Um, 
Okay. Maybe you can go down. Okay, a, a second solution is to allow the state of the network to depend on the new input as well as the previous state. So we're going to build up a state over time, incrementing it with new information that comes in. So we're going to let the network be recurrent. So here's an example of a recurrent neural network on the left here. Now you can see that in this popular, I have an input neuron down here. And I can give it a zero, and then a two, then a four, then a six, each in sequence. Then there's this recurrent part here, and you can see that the neurons are all connected to each other with these black edges. And then there's an output. I'll call this one the hidden layer. I'll call this one the hidden layer. And then in the output, what we're looking for is <clears throat> every time we give one of the inputs, we are looking for the network to output the next in the sequence. So when we input a zero, we want it to output a two. Um, then when we input the two, we want it to output a four. And when we input the four, we want a six and then an eight and so on. Okay. Now, of course, uh, we wouldn't expect to just input a zero and then have it say two necessarily. We might have to give it zero, two, four, and before it understands that the sequence is going up by counting up by twos. So a, a sort of a simpler picture of this network is on the right here. We have our input in the bottom here. Then we, it goes up to our hidden layer here. Now, the, each circle represents not just one node necessarily, but could be many nodes. And indeed, this, uh, this network on the left, I'm showing one input node, but it could actually be many input nodes that all project into this hidden uh, layer. And same with the output. We have output up here. And you can see um, there's connection weight matrices. So the input into the hidden has a connection weight matrix uh, U. And then from the hidden to the output is a connection weight matrix of V. And then the recurrent connections, the hidden layer, in, back into the hidden layer, has a, has a connection weight matrix W. Now I, I, I do this, um, there, there, here's a recurrent connection where the, it comes from the hidden layer back into the hidden layer. I added this square here to show that it takes a one time step for that feedback to happen. That's, that's all that means. Okay, so this is a recurrent neural network. Or RNN. Okay. In a recurrent neural network, the state of the hidden layer can encode the input sequence and thus have the information it needs to determine the proper output. So it's going you're going to encode a whole sequence. That's the idea. How? Well, we're not sure. It's, it's going to have to learn to do that. So how do we teach these neural networks? Let me introduce backprop through time. So this recurrent network is a neat idea, but how can we train it? So the idea is that first we unroll the network. Similar to what you can do for an autoencoder, although we didn't really we didn't really focus on that type of autoencoder, but we can enroll it. I'll show you what I mean. We're going to unroll it through time. So here's a drawing. Um, you can see it's sort of like each little column of three circles is, is like, kind of looks like the neural network the, with the input and then the hidden population and the output. But time goes from right to left. Sorry, left to right. Time goes from left to right. So in the first instance, we input uh, the first time step, we input a zero and then we wanted a two as output. Now, the next step in time, we input a two and we want 
a four as output, and so on. Four, we want a six as output, and put a six, we want an eight as output. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, it'll produce output at every stage, but um, we don't necessarily care what the output is until we're, we're, we reach the end of our input sequence, then there's a blank. Then we want to look at the output of our network and see what the what it predicts. Uh, so for example, maybe this eight's not here. And so we have a big question mark for what that's what goes there. So that would be the use of this recurrent neural network. So just to make things a little more concrete, let's put some uh, dimensions down here. Um, let's say the input is um, one by capital X. So the input is like a vector of uh, X numbers. The hidden will be one by H. So again, these are row vectors I'm using. The output will be one by Y. And now, just to be clear of some of the formulas here, HI is the activity of the hidden nodes. So it'll be sigma of uh, X, I, so I'm using superscripts here. This will be x2, this will be x3, x1. So I'm using superscripts to represent time step or, or step in a sequence. So h superscript i, oh, I've already, I labeled the x1, x2, and x3 right here. I like to repeat myself. <clears throat> So the hidden state hi is activation function applied to the input. So xi going through the uh, input connection weights plus, um, well, that's the first one's a bad example. Let's look at h3. It's got the input coming through the connection weights u. It's also got the input coming through its previous time step through w. So h i minus 1 times w, and then plus the bias. Now, <clears throat> the output y i is similarly um, sigma h i times connection weight matrix, matrix v plus some other bias. OK, so that's the basic uh, workings of the recurrent neural network. And so, like before, we have targets. And in fact, it'll be a sequence of targets, probably, T superscript I, and a loss function L. So at each time step, we can look at our loss. So we'll have a loss from our first time step, and the second, third, and so on. A loss for each of those. So now this unrolled network is a feed-forward network. The expression graph is a is a directed acyclic graph. So therefore, we can use backprop. So that's the idea of backprop through time. You unroll your your uh, recurrent network through uh, a fixed number of time steps. That's one of the issues with it is you have to decide how many time steps you want to unroll. I'm calling it tau in this case. It's, it's quite small, but that's supposed to be a tau there. Unroll it through uh, tau time steps. Then what your, your unrolled uh, network is a directed acyclic graph and you can apply backprop. Backprop through time is what this algorithm is called. Okay, so the loss or the error, the cost function, is typically some a uh, combination of the losses at each time step. I'll let's just call it the sum. Oops, I don't want that one. Now it's going to depend on the whole sequence. So it'll depend on y1 all the way up to y tau, as well as target one of the target tau. And it's going to be 
i equals 1 to tau of the loss between yi and target i. And I'll point out, you can also include a weight factor. You can put different weights on parts of the sequence. So in particular, you might not care about anything until the very last output. So you'd, all those alphas would be zero except for alpha sub tau. It's up to you. It depends on your application. Okay, as usual, we aim to minimize the expected cost over our data set. So that, that cost function I defined was for a single sequence. But of course, when you're training, you might have, you'll, you'll have many, many sequences that you train on. Okay, so we're <clears throat> looking for the uh, expected cost. We want to minimize the expected cost over our entire data set. Um, so our weights and biases, I'll just say our theta, but it's the u, v, w, and bias b and c. So we want to minimize, with respect to all those weights and biases, the expected value of e, where y1 up to y tau t1 to t tau over y t. So over the whole data set of sequences. So just like in backprop, we start with the feed forward pass. Then we start at the last output and propagate the error gradients back down through the network. I mean, uh, uh, it's backprop, so you um, it's a directed acyclic graph. So there's only one way to uh, to go backwards through it. But typically, what's done is uh, like there's a lot of structure in this unrolled network. So typically, what you do is you do a forward pass, you get all of your outputs, and you start at the last node up here, and you kind of work your way out and and sort of. Uh, cascade down through the network, stepping backwards in time. Okay, so the error um, uses all these things up here. <clears throat> so in terms of propagating the, the gradients down, some are easier than others. So let me show the easy ones. These gradients are easy. The gradient of your error with respect to what? Uh, yi or zi, where zi is the input current to the output nodes, or even v. The connection weights from the hidden layer to the output layer. So why is that? Let me tell you, let me show you why. So let's look at the at the gradient of the error or the cost with respect to Z sub K for some fixed K. So maybe it's maybe it's this one here, I. So it's equal to the gradient. Now replacing E with what it's equal to. It's the sum i equals one to tau of all those losses, y i t i. Which is equal to the sum from i equals one to tau. Now putting the, the gradient operator on the inside. Now the thing to notice here is that the only, I mean, if you look back up here at this drawing, the only uh, term in that sum that depends on zi, or sorry, on zk, is when i equals k. And so there's only one term in that sum that actually involves z sub k. or z super k, I should say, not sub k. So we can get rid of the summation. And focus only on the, the kth output. 
And now this is just similar to what you've done so far with backprop. <clears throat> There's a loss function, and then we have to push the loss function. Uh, well, we have the we have the loss, and we push the gradient. So we have the gradient of the loss, and we push the gradient through the activation function to the input current. So this will be familiar. It's the gradient of the loss with respect to the output. And Hadamard product by whoops, the derivative of the activation function. So that's just very back -proppy. What about the gradient of the error with respect to the connection weights from the hidden layer to the output layer, V? So for that, I want you to try that. Look at the exercises. But let me give you a little hint. The V shows up, uh, so Z sub K in the example I just did, Z sub K shows up only in one of those uh, final branches in one time step. V shows up in all of them. So your answer is going to be a sum, is going to be a sum over I, I equals uh, one to tau, because every one of those steps includes V. So it's going to be something there. Okay. Okay, time for a little joke. So a man and his son are driving down the street. And the boy says to his dad, Dad, what's an alcoholic? And the dad replies, well, son, see those four cars in front of us? An alcoholic would see eight cars because they see double. And the boy says, but dad, there are only two cars in front of us. <laughs> okay. Once we've descended down the hidden, uh, down to the hidden layer, it gets more interesting because now we get this this chain across time. It gets interesting because each unrolled hidden layer depends on the one before it. So, as I said before, we start at tau and work our way back in time. So to help us, let me define E superscript K. It's going to be the, uh, the output loss from time step K on, ignoring the first K minus one um, elements, because we're working our way back. So E superscript K is going to be all the error that we experience from K onwards. So it's the, the sum for i equals k to tau of the loss. Okay, now consider the gradient of the error with respect to h super tau, the last hidden state. We'll work that out in a minute. Before we do, notice that variables before time step k do not depend on variables after time step k. This is, this is what we call causality, that things in the past affect the future, but things in the future don't affect the past. Things in the future depend on the past. Things in the past don't depend on the future. Causality. So that comes out, um, I mean, that's all part of why this uh, unrolled uh, network is a directed acyclic graph in, in terms of dependency. So, i.e., h super k depends on h k minus 1. Not on h k plus 1. So, therefore, if we take the gradient of the error with respect to h sub k, we can write it down as um, 
so let me let me put in the drawing over here. Here's h sub k, let's say. I'll just write a k there. In terms of the directed acyclic graph, you can see that only this stuff up here depends on hk. <clears throat> okay, so in this part up here, the error for that part is ek. Right, so uh, the gradient of the error with respect to h sub k, that remember that error goes across all time, but since only the part, only ek from step k on depends on hk, we can ignore the other ones. I keep doing that. Okay, so I've replaced E with EK. That's progress, right? Because I've ruled out uh, some of the dependencies that could have been in place, but they're not. Okay, so keeping that in mind, the gradient of our error with respect to the last hidden, um, act, hidden, act, the gradient of our error with respect to the uh, last hidden state can be written as the gradient of E tau with respect to H tau. Okay. Now we might, let's just uh, sort of unfold that a little bit more. Just um, so we have to go down through a few layers, right? Like we've got, um, how much space do I need here? Okay, so we've got our output y, and then it goes through our z down to our hidden layer h. Um, and here's our, our error up here, depends on l. So we have to do the, all the backprop stuff through that. So going a step at a time. So that gradient of E tau with respect to Z tau is taking the gradient of the loss with respect to Y times the gradient or the derivative of Y with respect to Z, pushing the gradient through the uh, activation function. And then finally, times, uh, it'll be, yes, no, it'll be like this. Okay, so keeping that first part fairly simple, the second part can, well, what is uh, di z tau by di h tau? Remember, z, uh, I didn't explicitly write it, but z is the input current to the output nodes. This is z. What's di z by di h? It's v, or v transpose actually. And you can, you can, we've talked about the gradients of uh, vector products before, so you can look that up again. Okay, <clears throat> now, and I, I'll just repeat that I could replace I could put, fill that in with more stuff too, but I won't bother here because we've done that to death before. Okay, <clears throat> now an observation. Note that all paths between ek, which I have up here, and all this stuff down here has to pass through hk. So down here is xi, si, which is the input current to the hidden layer. That's this here.
h i for i less than or equal to k. So everything has to go through that hidden node, which makes sense, right? Our only link in, in a recurrent neural network, our only link uh, into the future is the hidden state, right? It gets recycled, and, and so the hidden state is our, is our um, way to sort of move through time. Okay, <clears throat> so it's going to be an important part in computing the, the gradients. So let's suppose we've already computed the gradient of um, E with respect to hidden state at time step H, uh, time step I plus one. Let's compute, let's go down one or back one step in time, compute the gradient of E with respect to hidden state H I, time step I. <clears throat> Okay, so we have the gradient to here, and we want to get it to here. So let me write it this way. We've got this gradient already. The gradient of E with respect to H I plus one. And what we want is to go back one more step in time get that and this is the gradient of E with respect to H I. Now you can see there are basically two paths which I've already got um, which I've already highlighted. One is this path from uh, from this loss up here. Oh boy didn't mean to do that from this stuff up here. So we can add that part in but there's this other part that goes um, forward in time through the future hidden state. Now we've already computed that gradient, so we can use that recurrently. Okay, <clears throat> so first of all, the gradient of E with respect to H sub I is the same as the gradient EI with respect to H sub I. We don't have to worry about uh, error terms that are further in the past, because they don't depend on this future H. Okay, well, I can rewrite that, that EI as the one, the loss from the one time step plus EI plus one, sort of the, the all the error from step I plus one on. Now I'm going to process each of those two pieces separately. Now the second part is the gradient. I want to write the gradient like this, but I'm going to decompose it one step because the gradient of EI plus one with respect to HI has to pass through this little conduit here, that connection. That's the only way. Okay, let's first work on this first uh, this first part here. So this part. The gradient of L with respect to H sub I. So just like before, we have to push the, the gradient through the, um, the loss function, through the activation function, through the connection weights, down to H I. So that gives us um, the gradient with respect to yi of the loss function, Hadamard times the slope of the loss function, and then all that times v transpose. So that's just backprop stuff. The other part I'm going to decompose into that. So I've already got this here, but I have to take care of the connection from between HI and HI plus one. Okay, so it's going to be times the Jacobian from HI plus one to HI. 
Okay, so rewriting this last line, uh, this whole first part's just the same. The second part is um, I have to push the gradient through that connection. So to go through that connection, remember we've got um, our hi plus one here. We have to go through the input current, si plus one, down to hi when these, these are connection weights w. So all this has to happen in that one term. So it's the gradient with respect to hi plus one of E right all that stuff is coming out of this thing here all that extra stuff pushing it through the activation function all that all that times um, push it through the activation function for the next time step and then times the connection weight matrix. So you can sit and look carefully at the dimensions and see that, that they all work out. Um, in particular, this is uh, y times h, and this is one by y. I'm just, I'm just doing a single sequence here. And this is one by h and h by h. And just to, yeah, that'll do. Okay. So the idea here is that once you have the gradients of the error with respect to the hidden activations, you can compute the stuff uh, that gives you kind of a the tool you need to produce to compute all these different gradients. So you compute the gradient with respect to the deeper weights and biases. So for example the gradient of the error with respect to W, or the gradient of the error with respect to U, the connection weights from the input to the hidden. And of course, there's a bias in there as well. But those will all be using uh, various bits, or will be using the gradient of the error with respect to these hidden activations. So in your, uh, luckily, uh, once you set up the back prop through time, you can use Autograd, and Autograd will do all this for you. But I'm going to force you to do a little bit of it uh, in the uh, exercises and in the assignment, just so you can feel like you have some grasp of what's going on underneath the hood and, and with the sorts of things that Autograd is taking care of. So this is how one way to train recurrent neural networks, back prop through time.